Savvy Business Radio, drawing out the best from our guests with our host, Christina Nitschman. Our guest today is Kevin J. Roberts. He specializes for the past 20 years in helping different learners and unique young people succeed. He is steeped in knowledge of brain science and the traps of surrounding the overuse of technology. He's written many books on the subject of ADHD and technology addiction. Today he shares his latest insightful book, Schindler's Gift, How One Man Harnessed ADHD to Change the World. Find out more about Kevin and his work at kevinjroberts.net. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to Savvy Business Radio. How are you today? Well, I'm doing great. I'm looking forward uh, to uh, spending time with my family during this holiday season and uh, just getting everything ready. So I'm busy, busy, busy. As a lot of people are, I'm sure, in this holiday season. But we're here to talk about an interesting subject. I, I don't know much about it, to be quite frank, and that's ADHD. You've written a number of books on, on people who are you know, working with that or having that um, in their lives, and also you know, maybe addiction to technology and such. I, I love the, the title of your book, Schindler's Gift, How One Man Harnesses ADHD to Change the World. Often it's seen as a negative thing to have ADHD, um, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, we were talking before the interview that, you know, in times past, it was important to have that trait if you're being hunted by a lion and you want to get the heck out of there and be alert and awake and, and you know, keep on the move. Well, I, you know, look, I'm not going to say that ADHD does not have challenges and liabilities. It certainly does. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we only focus on the liabilities and the challenges, we lose something. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you go to an emergency room, mm-hmm. a lot of the doctors who are working in there will have ADHD because those are individuals who prefer intensity. Mm-hmm. They prefer ex- excitement. They function best when things are really happening, when there's a crisis. Now, that doesn't mean all ADHD people are like that, but a good many of us are. Uh, ADHD people, on the other hand, we are very poor at routine, mm. at repetition, at the mundane duties and realities of life. Mm-hmm. So yes, I you know I watched the movie Schindler's List uh, perhaps almost twenty years ago, and it was when I watched that movie that I saw in Oscar Schindler, a man who saved mm. two twelve hundred Jewish people from the fires of the Holocaust. I saw in Steven Spielberg's depiction of Oscar Schindler a good many ADHD traits mm. uh, that I resonated with. And so I researched his life. And you know, this is Savvy Business Radio, so I should tell you I researched his success mm. in business and why before World War II and after World War II he was an almost abject failure but yet during the war, he not only succeeded at saving 1,200 Jewish lives, but he also had fabulous business success as well. And so I wondered what the lessons for humanity were in that great disparity, especially for people who have ADHD. Wow. So is it kind of like it's because he was living on the edge that created his success? And, and that's where if he lived in, on the edge, it just brings him to his greatest potential? Well, I think that's, I think there is some truth to, to what you just said. Mm-hmm. Um, and first of all, you, you, you pegged it. I mean, this was a guy who preferred living on the edge. Uh, what you, if you've seen Spielberg's film, and if you haven't, it's being, it's, uh, being re-released in this mm-hmm. month, December. Um, Oscar Schindler, you won't learn this from the movie, but he was a professional motorcycle racer. He was an automobile racer, professionally again almost died, killed himself several times. He failed out of school and he didn't like working for other people. So he tried his hand at business and over and over again, he failed miserably. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot, look, uh, uh-huh. you know, if, if you got some, I'm sure you have a, b- a bunch of your listeners are entrepreneurs or mm-hmm. budding entrepreneurs. Hey folks, we're all going to fail. Um, <laughs> There's, you know, and Bill Gates said the greatest lessons in life are learned from failure, not success. Mm -hmm. And I took that to heart when I researched the life of Oscar Schindler. Yeah, Uh, and that's true. I think so much of our society focuses on success. Even the people who've reached this pinnacle of super success, you're like, oh, look how amazing they are. They don't see the 20 years of failures and working up to that pinnacle of their peak 
that, okay, a lot of work goes behind that before you get to that point. And, and we want it right here, right now. And, and that's not how it works. You got to, yeah. you got to build it. A lot of times, yeah. you know, it's the failures that, that lead to the success. And, you know, people, uh, I have people ask me all the time, budding authors, well, how did, how did you get your books published? You know, how did you find a publisher? <laughs> well, let me tell you, it was years yeah. of uh, sending out manuscripts, um, perfecting mm -hmm. the book proposal, the 15 page book proposal. And then finally, you know, I had an agent and the agent didn't get me a deal. But finally, I got I landed my own first book deal with Hazelden Publishing and I did that, it took years to, wow. to really get to that level. Mm -hmm. And you know, writing a book is something that takes years as well. So I, I, gosh, I think, you know, we have to be willing to learn from our own failures. And in the case of Oscar Schindler, we can learn from both his successes and failures. And mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so easy to give up in business. I mean, that's what most of us do. I mean, and, and look, you know, I'm saying that and I am not the guru of persistence, Christina, because yeah. I have many times given up on a, an idea and then one, two, three years after I've given up, somebody brings that idea into fruition. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of drew you to the brain science study and all of that? What, what kind of drew you to that? Well, I found out in the mid, you know, when I taught school in my mid twenties that I had ADHD. I just thought I was weird. I'm still weird. At least my nephew, my, my nephew tells me that I, I said that one time, like, I just thought I was weird. And he says to me, he's like 15. He says, oh yeah, you're still weird. I hate to break it to you. Um, but I found out I had ADHD. And so a lot of the struggles of my life and a lot of the, the, the inner sensations of feeling different, they all made sense. And I decided I wanted to help others, you know, avoid my struggles. So uh, I started, you know, working as an ADHD coach and an academic wow. coach. And eventually I wanted mm -hmm. to do a master's degree. Initially, I was going to do a PhD in clinical psych, but I worked with um, Wayne State University Medical School and Antioch University. And we came up with an individualized program called ADHD Studies. Hmm. And so that It's through that master's degree working with Dr. Arthur Robin of Wayne State University Medical School that I got into really wanting to learn about the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, right now I'm involved with this in a study on how the brain impacts um, people who are uh, at heightened risk for cyber addiction. So, uh, yeah, well, mostly we're dealing with teenagers and young adults. Uh, yeah. But there are some fa I can't share the results. They're coming out next year in the New England Journal of Medicine. Mm -hmm. But it is a fascinating area. So, yes, I'm very interested in the brain. You know, a lot of people, Christina, say to me, mm -hmm. well, what, do you, what do you think the world needs to know about ADHD? Well, the first thing that we need to know about ADHD is that ADHD derives from differences in the size, shape, mm -hmm. structure, functioning, and in some cases, volume of the brain. ADHD is about differences in the brain. Now, if you want, I can give you sort of my elevator pitch example of how that's true, but only if you want. It's a little... Yeah, go for it. All right. Yeah. The brain has a structure in the front of the brain called the caudate nucleus. Okay. Um, you people at home can't see me, but um, basically the front of my head... And there's one on each side. The, the brain, they have parallel structures, one on the left, one on the right. Okay. Well, the caudate nucleus is known to be heavily associated and involved with our ability to control our impulses. Impulse control, it to, to some extent, to a significant extent, resides, is housed in the caudate nucleus. Mm -hmm. Now, ADHD people like me, we are often impulsive. Guess what? When you take and scan the brains mm -hmm. of ADHDers, especially in males, and this is more pronounced in males, mm -hmm. the right and left caudate nucleus are, are shaped differently. It's called asymmetry. There's an asymmetry between them. And if you know anything about the brain, when one side is the structure on one side is different from the parallel structure on the other, that's uh -huh. a problem. Yeah. Now, yeah. Here's, so just to backtrack, mm -hmm. if you take people with no history of impulsivity who sustain a closed head injury and it damages the caudate nucleus, those people almost always start to exhibit 
impulsivity. That's how certain we are about this part of the brain. Wow. Also, we talked about gene variation, mm -hmm. gene genetic variations mm -hmm. known to involve the caudate nucleus mm -hmm. are much, much, much more common in people with ADHD. So mm -hmm. there's a very small example of how that impulsivity is not about bad parenting. It's not about laziness. It's not about a lack of moral fiber. Mm -hmm. It's about a difference in the brain. Now, mm -hmm. Christina, let's flip it. Okay. Oscar Schindler was an impulsive person. Mm -hmm. He got in trouble in school. He was kicked out of school. He took risks on, as a motorcycle racer and an automobile racer. He worked as a spy for the German government. He was arrested and almost executed. It's a fascinating story when you get, the movie is fascinating, but the, the details of his life are even more fascinating. Uh -huh. Oscar Schindler took risks. That's what he did he, because he was impulsive. He needed to take risks, but during World War II, he took those risks with a purpose. Mm -hmm. And his purpose was to save human lives. So if Oscar Schindler had not had that need for intensity, had he not had that built in need mm -hmm. to take risk to feel fully alive, he would not have risked his life to save 1200 Jewish people from the fires of the Holocaust. So mm -hmm. therein we see the liability because uh -huh. he almost got executed by the Czechoslovak government. Mm -hmm. That's the liability. But there's a gift. The gift is he was willing to take risks. He was willing to do things. He wasn't the only German factory owner during World War II who mm -hmm. was kind to his Jewish workers. There were many. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of them you see in the movie Schindler's List, his name was Yuli, uh, Julius, Julius Madrich. Mm -hmm. And Madrich was very similar to Oscar Schindler in the way he treated his workers. Mm -hmm. But when Schindler hatched this plan, about moving his factory and spending money to bribe the Nazis, Modric wanted no part of it. Mm. Modric was a reasonable man. <laughs> Modric was a man who was calculated, kind but calculating. He wasn't going to spend all of his fortune and risk his life by, uh, by um, tripping off the ire of the Gestapo. Oh, no. But Oscar Schindler was not a normal man. He was a man who was prone to impulsivity and extreme risk taking. Mm -hmm. And in World War II, that skill was part and parcel to his saving 1,200 people. Wow. What this says to me, Kevin, though, is some of the greatest men and women in our history, probably the ones who were the greatest risk takers and maybe had ADHD, because to be a huge risk taker, is really important sometimes, like when he did what he did. But I'm sure there's other times to move forward in whatever purpose you're doing. Sometimes you need to take huge risks. Well, I certainly agree. I mean, you know, some people uh, take calculated risks because they think there's going to be a payoff, and some people are very calculated about it, and that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But there's another subset of human being that kind of needs to take risks. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the, you know, I don't want to be a poly, Pollyanna-ish about it. That behavioral trait can cause great problems. It can cause people to, you know, go into business ventures that they have no business going into. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, you know, Oscar Schindler certainly did this. He took stupid and ill-advised risks through mm -hmm. most of his life. But during that period, one of the things that he had that mm -hmm. every risk taker needs was support. He had, I call them his ADHD coaches, as his ADHD coaches, he had some of the greatest businessmen of Krakow at his disposal and who were under his care. They were Jewish businessmen and without their influence and their support and their guidance, he probably would have gone off, the whole operation would have gone off the rails. That's something that ADHD people need. We need a support network. We need people who understand us, who understand our condition, and who are able to help us harness mm -hmm. the power of ADHD so that we can make meaningful changes in the world. We can't do it without support. Really difficult. So what I'm, I'm, I'm hitting here, are the key elements I'm, I'm getting at, um, is, is support and purpose, that they need to be purpose-driven and, of course, supported. Or You're absolutely right. I didn't say it explicitly like that, but it's a, it's a point I make over and over again in my book, Schindler's Gift. It is ADHD people do not function well in a job. 
but they function well when you find help them find a purpose. Mm. Purpose drives success with everybody, mm -hmm. but especially with ADHDers. And guess what? That's a right. great point. Uh -huh. When you find something that works to motivate and to help ADHDers succeed, when it works for ADHDers, it almost always works for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's what I tell classroom teachers. If you have an active classroom, mm -hmm. uh, as my friend Susie Rollins likes to say when she teaches, does teacher trainings around the country, when you have an active classroom, the ADHD students do much better, but everybody enjoys it everybody benefits and so that's the thing that we're faced with you know we if, uh -huh. if we sort of tailor our teaching methods you know just to take school for a second to mm -hmm. 80 years almost everybody benefits from that mm -hmm. uh, in th that type of situation I, I love this because one thing that bothers me about you know any students with any difficulty I had um, extreme dyslexia I remember them thinking or telling my parents I was partially retarded or something and I'll never learn to read and I was like screw that I'm gonna learn to read I tried to teach myself didn't work out but <laughs> but uh, what I love is the idea is getting outside the box and realizing you don't have to te treat everyone the same and teach them the same because frankly just sitting up there talking uh, you know, it's route, uh, rote, you know, you're just throwing the information in there, spit it back to me. Have you really learned it? Have you experienced the information? And the other thing that drives me nuts today is the medication of it. Oh, you can't sit down. Well, let's just give you some medication, make you nice and docile. It's like, are you, are you really putting out people who are going to be and, and create their best and, and take their gifts and talents into the world? Or are you just medicating them so they shut up, sit down and be quiet? Well, it, it, you make an excellent point. And by the way, uh, Sir Richard Branson is dis, has dyslexia and, you know, the founder of Virgin Records and Virgin Airlines and the whole thing, you know, billionaire extraordinaire. And, you know, one of the things that he talks about, Christina, is that his parents supported every idea he ever had from the time he was a boy. If he wanted to do something, they would give him their support. They, he, I, I don't remember the exact words, but it was something along the lines of they were radically supportive of all of his endeavors. And so even though school was extraordinarily difficult, boring, against his grain, mm -hmm. his parents were so extensively supportive of him that he kept trying. And when he would fail, he would keep going. He would go and go and go. And there's a great example of a man who had support yeah. who knew how to, who th knew from having grown up with his parents, he knew how to get support and how to configure the right support in his life. And he used it to achieve extraordinary success. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, in the school, I mean, look, obviously the school system is becoming more and more rigid mm -hmm. uh, nowadays. And the people who are going into teaching, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but when you and I, you know, you're a little younger than me, but when you and I were in school, Mm -hmm. there were always some goofy and unusual teachers and, you know, p teachers that we liked and that were interesting. Those mm -hmm. folks are fewer and fewer and farther between than ever before. And I don't mm -hmm. get it. No, I don't either. It's almost like they want automatons and not anyone who actually learns any Thing at all and I don't know I mean uh, for me I thought a lot about this over the past years like what could we do to really really educate our youth and for me the teachers that made the greatest impact were ones that had his experience whatever the subject was and my favorite was my Italian teacher because he said you know in this Italian class you only speak Italian. This is day one, and I know no Italian. He said, you only speak Italian. You want to go to the bathroom? You got to tell me in Italian you need to go to the bathroom. You're not going to go to the bathroom. You, so, And then he would take us on field trips where we'd go out and about, and you have to speak Italian from the moment you start to the moment you end. And it really, you know, puts Italian into your bones, eh? And so that is uh, that to me is learning, experiencing whatever the craft or whatever the uh, subject matter is. It's not just by route, you know, I'm going to say it, you parrot it back and I give you an A. Well, and if, and that, that's an, that's a wonderful example because mm -hmm. the way that we teach foreign languages in this country is abysmal. Mm -hmm. Ask anybody who's 25, do mm -hmm. they remember the Spanish they took in high school? They don't remember a word because we do what you just said. We teach yeah. by rote mm -hmm. and we teach this grammatical analysis method yeah. that, that right, kids don't <laughs> learn to speak. You know, it would be better if kids got out of school and they had a functional conversational ability mm -hmm. and only, you know, let's say there's, you know, 
a hundred, the, the, let's say there's a hundred levels, you know, a grammatical gradient. Well, we want to get them through a hundred, you know, the, 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 the past per, perfect progressive and all these tenses. They, not, they don't retain any of it. If, if we could just go to level 25, but they actually retain and they could speak it, it would be much, much better, better for our society, better for our businesses, better for our standing in the world. But we really do a pathetically poor job. And I speak six languages, by the way. That's, my, that's one of my things. I have, I love, love, love foreign language. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably the way, part of the way my brain is built. Mm -hmm. I've actually been in uh, studies because of that. I'm not going to go into that now. Mm -hmm. um, but my brain has been examined. But I'll tell you something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Oscar Schindler, to go back to my boy, Oscar, he hated school. And that, that school was very, very, very rigid. You know, here's this guy who goes on to challenge and to manipulate the, some of the greatest forces of evil ever arrayed against humanity, but he failed at school. You know, the system that's supposed to educate him and outfit him with the knowledge and the skills for life. It didn't do any of that, and it doesn't do that for a lot of kids, especially like kids like you mm -hmm. who, are, who are creative and different and just, you know, really feel at odds with the way I felt the same way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, you can talk, I'm 49. Uh, look at how hyperactive, you're, you're, you know, we're on camera with each other. Look how hyperactive I am. Imagine me at like 14. <laughs> this is how I am at 49. Imagine how hard it was for me to keep my mouth shut and sit still. It was, it was incredibly difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally can relate to you there. I mean, for me, when I couldn't figure out mathematics or even English, I said, give me the books, I'll figure it out myself. And I actually was trying to go home and look at the math books and come up with my own formulas. I'm like, it didn't really work very well. But uh, that, my attitude is like, go there, go out there and make it happen. Don't sit here and wait for it to happen. And so, uh, but the beauty of it is direction and support. What ended up happening, the blessing that happened for me is coming to New York, getting into school performing arts. And oh, they wow. saw my great difficulty and they said, okay, we're not going to throw you out. We never throw anyone away. We're going to get you the support you need. And so they got me some tutors that helped me understand how to read and write. Yeah, and, and do it at my own pace and uh, with a lot of hard work and uh, my part, but also the support of them, I was able to keep up mainstream within six months and stay there and, and continue to love to learn, but at my way, my tempo, not the way, you know, they do it in college. I went to college, hated it and said, no, I'm, I'm teaching myself. I'm, I hire tutors, hire people who are experts and I learn from them, but I do it my way. Well, and that's like I said, I did my master's degree my way, you know, and I live in Michigan, but there are people on the East Coast who are part of the ADHD, you know, professional community. And, yeah. and they like people laugh about, well, he says he's got a master's degree in ADHD studies. There's <laughs> no such thing. I mean, I'm telling you, I've had people come back and tell me stories. And it's like, no, there actually is. And I made it. I'm the only person I know that has done this. But yeah, you can do things your own way. What's that Fleetwood Mac song? You can go your own way. That's my theme yeah, song. Okay? Exactly. Yeah. Um, but you know, look, if you know, the people out there, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, you're probably somebody mm -hmm. uh, who wants to go his or her own way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, you know, one of the, one of the problems though, and I don't want to rain on anybody's parade because I go my own way too, let me tell you, but you know, Oscar Schindler, he went his own way after World War II, but he didn't have support mm. and he floundered. He went into one business adventure after another simply to make money. He wasn't good at making money. He was only good at making money when he had a sense of mission and a mm -hmm. sense of purpose. And so if, you know, I don't care if people listening to your program, I don't know if they're, you know, whether they're business people or entrepreneurs or just people who like to keep abreast of uh, new and creative trends. Listen, you know, don't get into a business, find your mission and find a way to have your mission support you and to support your business. That's the message of Oscar Schindler's life. And another message is get support. Yeah. Find those key, just like you got support. You found that you found the right people to support you, and that made all the difference in the world. And it sounds to me that you found people who got you, yes, who understood how your mind worked. And not everybody gets you, not everybody gets me, but boy, if we can, you know, cast a wide net mm -hmm. and find those people who get us, mm -hmm. that can make a huge difference in the success that we eventually come out with. 
Yeah. And you mentioned something very important besides uh, getting very clear on your mission and purpose in life and then find a way to, you know, bring that into the world in a way that you can be a career, a vocation, but also that support system being so, so important. But it's interesting. When I first got started, I would look at other businesses and I would say, okay, I'm going to copy them because they're successful, but they're not me. They're, you know, even if they're doing the same thing, I'm doing it. I'm the only one who could bring it to the world my way. So stop looking at other businesses and how, I mean, you can learn from them for sure and get support from them and mentorship, but don't copy them and be a duplicate of them. You're not them. Yeah. And you know, I'm living proof of forging one's own way because how I make most of my living Mm -hmm. is you're talking to me from my home and five days a week, I open up my home to ADHD teenagers and young adults and they come over here and we have study groups Mm. and I help them succeed in school and do for them probably what some of your tutors did for you, but I I don't do it the way anybody else does it. It's a group. We have fun. It's exciting. There's lights, there's food, there's music. It's a very fun, I call it ADHD approved environment. And I'm going to tell you right now, nobody does what I do. Nobody. I've I've searched. I've tried to find it. I have had people say, oh, I think she does kind of the same thing you do. And I look at it. Nope, she doesn't. So I found a way to make a living that works for me. Mm-hmm. And it works for a lot of young people, too, because, you know, you I can tell you right now, you're the type of person that would have, you know, if you if you were a teenager right now, you're the type of person who would have done well, who would do well with me. Because mm-hmm. uh, I my specialty is helping people understand how their brains work and how they're going to get you know, the best success, what they need to do to achieve uh, their purposes. But you gotta find the purpose. Yes. You, gotta find, you gotta find the purpose. You can't impose the purpose. And my gosh, people out there listening, don't let somebody else impose a purpose on you. You gotta find your mm-hmm. own purpose. You yeah. gotta find what excites your heart. And tell me, this happened to me, when I discovered my, my great purpose, which here now is what I'm doing right now, is bringing people's messages to the world and, and having them share their message, their wisdom. This is it right here. And when I first started moving from you know, the finance coaching thingy, consulting that I did in corporate America, then brought it over to a business, I did not explode as a person, my gifts and talents, and, and where I am doing this right now until I let go of the naysayers because they're going to come and say, Oh, that's not normal. People can't money, make money off of podcasting, which they can. Um, but before it was kitschy to do it, I, I was actually doing it and I was just right out of the box and I saw people were getting value and I started charging for advertising very shortly after and people paid because they saw the value. But I, I think what's hard for people sometimes they'll, they'll be like, well, they're naysayers say I should just follow what everyone else is doing. No, don't follow what everyone else is doing. Follow where you feel pulled, where you see that your gifts are being used the most and, and who cares about what the naysayers are saying. Well, you know, I have a friend and uh, I want to do a shout out to my friend in Louisville, uh, mm-hmm. Maggie Payette Harlow and Maggie is, and her husband many years ago, uh, decided to get involved in a franchise of a company called Sinorama. Hmm. And everybody, uh, you know, people were naysayers. People didn't get what she was trying to do, but she got it. And she Hmm. had passion about that. And she has passion about helping people get the word out about their business. And it's a sense of mission for her. Hmm. And, uh, you know, she's received honors in, you know, the greater Louisville area. But she, just like you, Maggie did not listen to the naysayers and she has a very thriving business, Sinorama, Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. And, you know, so, and she's very creative. She's a lot like you actually. And, uh, you know, she, she fo- followed her heart. She's got a husband who's very supportive, very good at a lot of the details. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, she did it her own way and you can do it. You just mm-hmm. got to have the right circumstances. I'm you know, I'm, I got a guy who's a friend of mine, Um, his name is Brian and Brian is a freelance photographer and he's also an ADHD -er. Mm -hmm. and he and I get together one, once a week for three or four hours. We, we don't really do anything to help each other, but we both need somebody else there to hold us accountable. And it's Mm -hmm. a support system for us. Very important. Pay anybody. We don't need to pay anybody. We just need, so we hang out usually at my house mm-hmm. and he does his stuff and I do my stuff. And then if we encounter a problem, we 
have a get together and we try to resolve the situation, but we need support. And so yeah. he and I do that for each other. That's a great model. Yeah. Uh, Oscar Schindler had that when he was during World War II, mm -hmm. but after World War II, he didn't, he tried to go it alone. And uh, so the message of his life, which you really don't get from the movie, uh, is that when he tried to go it alone, when he didn't have the support, he floundered. And that's the yeah. way a lot of us are. Yeah. And now more than ever, uh, you've had several books about technology uh, addiction, but technology can be a blessing. That's where you can connect with others. Uh, maybe not in your backyard. If you're not like in a city, there's still ways to connect with people using technology where you can connect with people like yourself to come together to have accountability and support. It's probably easier than ever to have. Yeah, that. absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to start hosting um, Zoom parties for parents who have ADHD kids. And I'm, you know, I'm going to start doing that. And people can join from all over the world. And I, and I do speak all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful. Technology allows me to keep in touch with people. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, my gosh, um, I have people every week. They'll say, you know, my son loved when you gave a talk. Can you do a video to him? And I'll just pull out my phone and I do a quick video. I post it on the internet. And, you know, I, 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 got a, I did that for somebody on the island of Guernsey recently. Wow. The mm -hmm. Channel Island that I spoke at in October. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, technology is a wonderful thing. But I'm one of those people that I can get so absorbed in some aspects of it that my life suffers. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that, I'm not, that's not just a throwaway line. I'm mm -hmm. not just doing that because I'm Kevin Roberts, the cyber addiction expert who was on 2020 last year. No, that's true, man. Every day, mm -hmm. you know, part of me wants to go up to my office and get on the computer and play computer games. And I can play for five, six, eight, ten 10 hours. No yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah, I can totally see. And look at the people I know who like can text for like ever. And they, when their phone uh, broke down, one of my friends' phone, uh, her phone broke down. She was about lost it. It was like she was about to have a nervous breakdown. And I'm like, oh my gosh. But yeah, there's there's that blessing, but also that curse if you're not careful with keeping in check. Um, but this has been such a fascinating talk. I, I don't want to leave without everyone finding out how they can find out more about you. Well, you can simply. Uh, there's a couple things you can do. First of all, I'll give you my email. Kevin, K-E-V-I-N, Kevin at Kevin J. Roberts. Now, don't forget the J in the middle, KevinJRoberts.net, not .com, .net. Now, if you just put in Kevin Roberts, you're going to come up with a marketing guru who's Canadian, who's one of the world's great marketing experts, uh, gets like, you know, $150,000 a speech, so I wish I were him. <laughs> uh, but you, you can also go to Amazon. And if you're interested in Schindler's Gift, it's available there. Schindler's Gift, How One Man Harnessed ADHD to Change the World. And I also have bo other books on ADHD as well as you're interested in the cyber angle. It's called Cyber Junkie. Mm -hmm. And also one of my favorites, uh, I, I have to say it in a dramatic way, Get Off That Game Now, The Essential Family Guide to Healthy Screen Behavior. Yeah. Um, that's an ebook. So, mm -hmm. uh, listen, this has been great. I, um, you know, we booked this thing through LinkedIn. I had no idea you were such a fun and exciting person. This is great. I had a great time. Thank Usually you. Usually I'm just, I'm kind of fighting like, you know, in my brain, I'm going, gosh, how long is this going to take? But this <laughs> is great. It's yeah. been on here 10 minutes, but I know it's much longer than that. So yeah. it's been fabulous. Thank you so much. You shared so much great wisdom and tips. It doesn't matter if you have ADHD or not find that purpose, that support system that we all need. And thank you so much, Kevin, for coming to share your great wisdom today on Savvy Business Radio. Absolutely. Pleasure. Thank you. Savvy Business Radio broadcasts worldwide via a large podcast network celebrating business owners, entrepreneurs, influencers, and successful individuals. Find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest. Call 732-474-7375 or email Christina at SavvyBusinessRadio.com.